Matthew chapter number 9, begin reading in verse number 36. The Bible says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you understand that the book of Matthew was written to the Hebrews. So in this verse, when it talks about how he saw the multitudes because they were fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd, he's talking about the children of Israel. Let's see. About, oh, 4,000 years ago, give or take, a little bit after, Israel had its own lands, had its own people, had a place that was theirs, that eventually Solomon, led by God and given permission by God to build Solomon's temple, they had a, not just the God of all gods, they had dedicated and consecrated a place that was known as God's house in Jerusalem to represent that God's people had a place, but the God of Israel also had a place. They had a place that was theirs. They had what we would call a homeland. Okay? By the time Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he's still in what today we would call the country of Israel. That's not everything that Israel used to have. If you go study the book of Exodus, if you go study what God promised Abraham would be his inheritance, they had everything from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River, and then north and south of that. Well, if you were to look at that map over there, that's a whole lot bigger swath of land than what was relegated back in the 1940s. And the Arabs are still angry that they gave them that little sliver of it. But everything that Abraham walked on, even though he didn't own it then, by faith he knew that his descendants would own it at some point. Nowadays, we may refer to it as Canaan land because they crossed over Jordan into Canaan. But everything that they, you know, essentially saw, you could, especially back in the day when walking, you could walk for a whole long time and still never see everything that God had blessed Israel with. But then by the time Jesus shows up, they have nothing to call their own. They're under the ruling of Caesar at this point. If you go study the Roman Empire, they pretty much owned everything around the Mediterranean Sea. And then some. And then, before that, they were under the captivity of Babylon. Before that, it was the Medes and the Persians and so on and so forth. Israel had been driven out from the place that God had them because they had driven out God from their hearts. They rebelled against God. As recompense, God allowed what was given to be taken away. And where once they were the ones that had free reign to go and do as they pleased, now they lived under the whims of somebody else. In fact, a lot of the time, not just we think of the slavery of Israel referring to Egypt, but when Babylon came in and took everything over, many of them were made slaves again. I mean, that's essentially what Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you prefer the Hebrew names, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, they were considered, you know, of the chosen. They were wise men, as the Bible would call them. They were advisors to the king, but they weren't free. They lived where the king told them to live. They did what the king told them to do. And they couldn't leave unless the king said to leave. In fact, through much of the latter Old Testament, you find those like Ezekiel or uh, others that wanted to go back to Israel. They had to get... They couldn't just go and start the old city. They had to get permission. And then, to further show, they had nothing of their own... I mean, when the wall was being rebuilt around Jerusalem, the king was the one that provided all the means to do it. Israel didn't have anything of their own because it had all been taken away. And so Jesus shows up, and there is no group of God's people. They're scattered. 
There's some here, there's some there. Look at verse number 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He has to travel far and wide to go see God's people. He can't just go to Jerusalem and find God's people because God's people have been scattered. If you will, verse number 36, they were as sheep having no shepherd. They were wandering in the darkness. They had no one to guide them. They had been left to their own inclinations on how to best live life. Because at one point, go back and study the book of Judges, go for, look at Joshua and Moses, Israel had no king. God was Israel's king. God said, you're my people, I'm going to lead you. And then eventually Israel, desiring to be like other kingdoms, begged God to give them a king. And God acquiesced. And then Israel got their eyes off of God and started looking at a man. And you can go through it. Saul, David, Solomon. As great as they were in the beginning, all of them had problems in the end. Now we know about David's great sin. He also numbered the people. He was a man of bloody hands. That's why God wouldn't let him build the temple. Because of the actions of Uriah the Hittite. He had him slain in battle, knowing that if he called the retreat, Uriah wouldn't. Also, he didn't have his wife. Solomon, in his old age, bowed down and worshipped other gods. Saul disobeyed God's commandments, and then as a result, went mad, knowing that God no longer overshadowed him with the Holy Spirit drove him crazy knowing that he had God but then he made a decision and then God departed they attacked those that loved him the most they tried to kill David his son-in-law who all David ever wanted you know did for him was what the king asked and all he desired for him was his peace his safety and his security even three times delivered into the hand of David, he said he would not touch God's anointed. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, at once Israel had a place. They were a unified people. They had leadership. But when Jesus comes, they're scattered. They're lost in the wilderness. And as shepherd, the great shepherd, Jesus, in verse number 36, he says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Was he moved with compassion on them because they were captives in a foreign land? No. Was he moved with compassion because of their sickness and because of their ailments? No. It says that he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, because they were weary, and were scattered abroad. They had been driven out as sheep having no shepherd. Now, we've heard a preacher turn around here. Sheep are dumb animals. They tell me that a sheep, once it starts walking in a straight line, it takes a whole lot for that sheep to turn. In fact, if there's a cliff, just a drop-off, if you don't stop a sheep, sheep's going to walk off the edge of that cliff. And it's going to die. It can't understand the danger that's blatant and put in front of it. Well, why did Jesus have compassion? Because Israel at this point, they were like sheep with no shepherd. They were all walking in the direction that they thought was correct, that they thought was right, that this surely will bring us favor with God, and all they're doing is walking off a cliff. There's no safety, there's no security. The only thing in front of them is damnation. But then, not only that, it says that they fainted. Keep in mind, between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, there's about 400 years where God did not raise up a prophet. Where God did not have a voice to remind Israel they had to return to the old paths. They had to preserve what God had said in times past because once God said it, that settled it. doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. All it takes is God to say He says it more than once. Well, they fainted because they were no longer, not necessarily because of decisions made in their lifetime, 
But by the time Jesus comes along, they're no longer living as thus saith the Lord. They're living as thus saith the Pharisee, thus saith the Sadducee, and thus saith the scribe. A religious sect, if you will, have been raised up because they quote-unquote knew all the right stuff, but yet everything that they taught other people was burdensome to them. They were put under a heavy load. Now they still lived according to the law, but the purpose of the law had been lost upon them. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees thought because they act right, they dressed right, they talked right, they walked right, that they were right with God. In fact, oftentimes in the book of Acts, you're going to find where the apostles preached against, it's not that you've got a claim to God through Abraham. God claimed Abraham. Abraham didn't claim God. Where you come from doesn't make you special. Who your ancestors were doesn't make you special. What church you go to doesn't make you special. The only thing that makes you special is the blood of Jesus being applied to your life. But he sees them feigning because what well, the sun sets you free, free indeed. He'll break the chains. He'll remove the... He said, take his yoke upon him because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. What burden were these people under? These people were under the burden of trying to impress God. To earn God's favor. You go study back out in the wilderness with Moses through most of the Old Testament. People knew that sacrifices did not merit the favor of God. Sacrifices were in obedience to God. They knew that their actions did not earn them anything. They were simply fulfilling what God told them to do because they knew as long as they were obedient to God that God would be faithful towards the promises that He made towards them. Even times when they weren't obedient, God's still faithful to His promises because it's impossible for God to lie. So many times in the Old Testament we read where it says that they had left their first love. That they had forgotten their espousals or the promises and commitments that they had made towards God. But God never forgot. God never took back any of the promises or espousals that He made to them. And they left the path that God had intended for them and now they're bearing the weight of trying to live in a world that they thought in their days that it was the last days, that it couldn't get any more evil than it was then. And yet, I mean, granted, they had a very evil, wicked, and carnal emperor by the time we get to the book of Acts. His name is Nero. One of the most humanistic and debaucherous people to ever walk the earth. And they thought it couldn't get worse than that. They think that they're living in the end time and they have no hope. You can endure a whole lot as long as you've got hope. There's a lot of burdens and there's a lot of weight that you're willing to take an extra mile or two or three. You're willing to carry it all the way home to glory as long as you've got hope. But the problem is that in this day they had no hope. They weren't living off of the promises of God. They were living under the law of God. And the only thing that the law promised was death. The only thing that the law promised was that you were a sinner. That there was no forgiveness at best to push your sins back for a year. But your sins were still out. They were behind God's back. They were as far as east from the west, but they still there. But we find that Jesus came and your sins are forgiven, gone. That means as if they never existed before. He sees them shouldering that weight, shouldering that burden. And they're feigning under. You can't bear the weight of your own sins. That's why Jesus had to bear the cross for you. But more importantly than that, you can't bear the weight of your own spirituality. You really think that you've got the strength to robe yourself in righteousness every day? You really think that you've got the strength to resist the devil in all of his power? No. Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus, when he came, was created a little lower than the angels? Meaning less than the angels? What was Lucifer? He was the highest angel that there ever was. You think you're going to... But yet there's people out there 
who think that they've got to wrestle all the evil in their life in order to be victorious over that's a fainting proposition you're not going to get very far down that road but not only are they sheep not only are they fainting it says that they were scattered they tell me I don't know I'm kind of weird I don't mind being by myself I'm a, God made me a hermit only thing I'm missing is a cave okay but they say I mean the Bible teaches no man liveth unto himself no man dieth unto himself God did not make you a singularity in the universe what's that mean that you exist by yourself God puts you into a world knowing that there'd be people around you God puts you into a world craving fellowship now what the world don't teach you is that the fellowship that you're craving is with God your very soul knows that there is a God because when God breathed into man the breath of life the soul knows where it came from and most of the loneliness that people feel is because they don't have a relationship with their creator but what did Adam and Eve do well long before Eve came Adam was still in the garden and it says that God sought out a help meet for him because even though he fellowshiped with God every day he could look up and see God's throne in the sides of the north he wasn't burdened with this carnality God good for Adam to have a companion that it wasn't good the way that God made you you need other people and you need your Savior now I dare say if you've got the Savior if God leads you into a place where you're alone you're going to be okay because you got Him but it says that they're scattered abroad they are alone they're isolated you know why sheep are safe in a flock but not on themselves because the bigger the group is they may be dumb but they may be easily led may not be you know the strongest thing in the world but you know a, a kick from a sheep may not hurt the worst but a kick from a hundred sheep they get panicked they get spooked and they just start bucking and kicking out at things that's dangerous in a group if one of them's taken and cries out the rest of them gonna hear it and if they start making a bunch of commotion then the shepherd's gonna hear it but if you by yourself and something cuts off your windpipe and you can't scream there's nobody around to alert the shepherd now see our shepherd he knows exactly where you're at and he knows the number of hairs on your head he knows you're up sitting you're uprising and you're down to it long before you ever were he knew every step that you would take in life and because of that he gave a thing called a church he gave a thing called a home long before they ever made a church he gave a thing called fellowship in fact how much of the New Testament talks about how we ought to live and dwell in fellowship as a unified body of Christ but he saw these people and they were scattered they were alone not only did they have no hope they had no help see the way that God engineered things every now and then when you're down at your lowest he may just prick somebody's heart have them come over and speak a word fitly spoken to give you a little bit of hope or encouragement to build you up but if you're isolated if you've removed yourself from those that could be a support unto you and you are utterly alone that's a bad place to be in when you've got no person to lead you you got no hope and you got no help that's where Israel was in this day and Jesus looks out on the people and it doesn't say that he felt pity for them it doesn't say that he felt sorry for them it said verse number 36 that when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion on them 
Now, y'all have seen the ASPCA commercials that they put the Sarah McLaughlin song on and they show all the shaky dogs and they're scared and they look pitiful. All them dogs are dead now. Those commercials were made so long ago, them dogs don't exist no more. Okay? I hate to break that to you. Right? But the pet that you had as a kid isn't around anymore. Them commercials is over 10 years old. That's got to be the longest living dog in the world for that thing to still be around. Okay? Because they didn't look like puppies in the commercial either. But you see them, and why are they effective? Because they move your heart. Oh, look at that. We need to go adopt one. Well, you're not going to get the one in the commercial. That one's dead. You're going to get the half-crazed neurotic one <laughs> that was left over because you had to watch the commercial. The people that wanted the good dog showed up before the commercial. Okay? You're going to get the one that's had rabies four times, but now they claim he doesn't have it no more, and then one of these days you're going to have to old yeller it, and you're going to feel awful. Okay? You should have known better. What are you saying, Brother George? There are things that will uh, manipulate your emotions. But see, I mentioned that commercial. How many people in here actually went down to the ASPCA shelter and got a dog after watching the commercial? You were moved emotionally, but you were not moved physically. It says here that Jesus was moved towards the... Because of what he saw, he went and did something about it. That's why he came in the first place. You can't say, oh, well, that moved my spirit. Either it moved you or it didn't move you. Either it caused you to change or to do something different, or you stayed the exact same way that you were before. Well, why was he moved? Because, we go on, he was moved with compassion. He wasn't moved out of anger. He wasn't moved out of righteous indignation. He wasn't moved out of pity. He wasn't moved out of obligation. He was moved with compassion. And then it says, on them. Not towards them. Right? Natural disaster. I mean, y'all remember the tornado, and then y'all remember the floods down in Hazard in Kentucky. There was a lot of people that were moved towards compassion. What'd they do? They went, they emptied out their pocketbook, and they said, here, this will help. And then there's other people that actually went, and they were boots on the ground and helped people with that money. You can be moved towards something, or you can be moved on something. You may be moved on, or I mean towards, doing what you can. But we all have limitations. If God wanted you to be a missionary on a foreign field, you'd be a missionary on a foreign field. I firmly believe that. You can try and run for a while, but Brother Ron, you're going to give up eventually and finally submit. If God wants you there, God's going to get you there. The exhibit A, see Jonah. But, but God didn't call you to go to a foreign field. Well, you could be moved towards a foreign field. That means that you feel a little bit for them, but you're trying to ease your own conscience. You know you should do something, you just don't know what. So you just try to do a little and then convince yourself that you did your part. I'm glad the Lord didn't look at your situation and my situation and say, well, I'll do a little for them, but they got to do the rest. No, it says he was moved with compassion on them. He made sure that there was no obstacle between him and his compassion and them. He took his compassion and made sure that they received it. Now I get it, you may not be able to go, but there's a way to ensure that you're invested in whatever it is that God wants you to be invested in. It's called getting a burden. If you don't have a burden, you can put it back down. Biblically, a burden is something that you pick up. Because even if God gives you the burden, God puts the burden in front of you and asks you to pick it up. He doesn't put it on top of you. 
He doesn't burden you as an evil taskmaster just throwing more things on you. He says, this is the load that I'd like you to carry and you've got to pick it up and take it with you. Because if God gave it to you, you wouldn't be able to put it back down. But the biblical definition of a burden is something that you pick up and you affix it to you. It means that it can't be taken off. Because let's be honest, if God said that this, this is your burden, you should desire to carry it and not put it down. Because it means that God wants you to carry it, only you to carry it, and if you don't carry it, nobody's going to carry it. Biblically, a burden is something that becomes a part of you. It's not something on your shoulder. It's something that has become a part of you. It is engrafted into you as God engrafts you into a local body of called out believers. It becomes a part of your body spiritually. Why? Because God said for me to carry it. So I'm not going to carry it on my shoulder where it can fall off. I'm not going to put it in the back of a cart where it can be jostled and you know it may fall off of the cart. I'm going to carry it right here with me in my very soul. That's a biblical burden. Well, if you get that kind of burden, you're going to make sure that whatever God has burdened you with is going to get to wherever God told you to get it to. Best example would be the lame man that had the four friends. They get to the house. They see first the multitude around the house. Somehow they got through that crowd while carrying a fellow while everybody else is trying to get as close as they can get to hear what Jesus is saying. Then once they get there, the Bible doesn't say that they had a staircase to the roof. They had to get a lame fella up the side of a building. And then when they got up there, they tore the roof off and then lowered them down. That means that they had more tools than just their hands because to lower them down, they'd at least have to have had ropes. But they did all that, keeping in mind that the lame fellow never fell off the bed. He wasn't able to move himself. He didn't have control over his own body. So as they're bumping through the crowd, try, excuse me, pardon me, they can't bump too hard or he's going to fall off the mat. The bed may have made it up to the roof, but they made sure that the fellow on top of the bed made it up to the roof. And then they were certain that Jesus was the only hope that they got literally everything out of the way between Jesus and that man talking about the roof. And then I believe, because they believed that it was their burden to if there never was a hole. Jesus told that man take up his bed and go. He didn't say that to the four fellows with him. I don't know how long it took them to patch the roof, but they stayed until it was done. Like as God gave him a burden to do whatever it was necessary to get that fellow to Jesus. They moved their bodies because of the compassion they felt. But where did they get that fellow? They got him right on the spot that God wanted them to be on. They didn't say, well, hey, if you can find some people that will take you down there to Jesus, I bet you he could help you. That would have been more than what the two people that passed by that man dying in the ditch did before the Good Samaritan showed up. They pretended like he didn't exist. They could have been moved towards compassion and said, hey, I heard about somebody that can help you. His name's Jesus. that Pharisee, the religious man, and then the, the pious Jewish man, neither one of them even looked at the fellow in the ditch. In fact, they tried to hide it. They were like, I'm going to cross over the side of the road so I can say that I didn't see him. Because they knew they ought to do something. They didn't even say, hey, if you can get yourself down there, there's a doctor at that end that knows how to treat wounds like the ones you got. But then a fellow came by who was moved with compassion on him. Where to get him to? Where he needed to be. How long it take? Didn't matter to the Samaritan. How much did it cost him? He didn't even know at the time. He said, if I owe anything more, I'll hit you on the next trip through. Which means he gave more than he knew the initial cost was going to be and said, I hope that's enough to pay for everything. 
But if not, let me know. There could have been a big bill associated with that act of compassion. But yet he burdened himself with it. He didn't say, charge that fella. Charge me. He wasn't even able to get here on his own. I don't know if he can pay for the services you're going to give him. Put that on my account. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that compassion is a whole lot more than we think it really is. If you like me, anybody guilty of you see people doing stupid things out in the world and you get angry at it? God's angry at the w wicked every day. But yet, what's he do? He puts that anger aside for the moment and he still extends compassion today. There's coming a day of reckoning when God's wrath will be poured out on this world, but it is not today. Hallelujah. And if you're saved, you're not going to be around for that day. You're not going to have to witness the clouds in the sky being rolled back as a scroll and having the very face of God shown towards you where men run to the mountains and the hills begging to be crushed by rocks so they don't have to look on the face of God. You're not going to have to suffer the tribulation that this world you know, goes through for what they did to God's Son. But see, today... God calls us to use the same thing that Jesus used, which was compassion. True compassion will move you to where you need to be, and then it will continue to move you until you get to where you need to go. Look around. Jesus said, verse number 37, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. He's moved with compassion because he knows there's so many and there were so few that were going. He's the very Son of God. He doesn't say that the lambs are few. There was only one lamb and that's all that was needed. He didn't say that the sacrifice was few. The sacrifice that he made endures to today and will forevermore. Only needed one. What's he say? That the laborers are few. He knew that the master was going to get what the master needed done. But he also knew that there were very few going out to the highways and hedges and saying the master's having a feast and he wants you there. Don't know why I meant that illustration wasn't in my point. But when the master said go out to the highways and hedges and make sure that his feast was full, he didn't tell them go out there and tell them that there's a feast. He said go and bring them. Have compassion on them. Find those that think that there's nobody out there that cares for them and bring them in and let them know that I've made a feast for them. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's so much opportunity for in the flesh for you to feel hate, anger, to write things off that you see as, well, they got what they deserved. No, if they'd have got what they deserved, they'd have been in hell. The fact that they're still around is because God wants to give them something different. And I'm convinced that the world would have been reached a whole lot quicker if people still had compassion. 